Welcome to Western Civilization History 150. This is week one. We're going to be discussing pre civilization and then we'll be moving into emerging civilizations and specifically looking at Mesopotamia. Before we get started, we're going to be looking first at the historical timeline. Um, this is something that people often get confused, so I want to make sure everybody's on the same page before we go forward. The common designation for before the year zero is BCE, before the Common Era. In the United States, we often use BC, i.e. before Christ. Um, after the year zero, historians designate this as CE, or Common Era. Why? Well, every historian in the world is not Christian. Uh, keep in mind there's about a billion uh, Muslims, there's a billion Hindus, half a billion Buddhists, and a whole bunch of other religions. So, um, from the international perspective, we're going to be looking at this from a non-religious function, so before Common Era, and then the Common Era. <coughs> also, remember that the year 0 to the year 99 counts as the first century. So the year we live in is 2014, but it is the 21st century. The reverse is also true. From the year 99 BCE to 1 BCE, that is the first century BCE. A very easy way to kind of think of it is take the year and add one to get to the correct century if you can if you get confused. Uh, the other thing I want you to look at is on this slide you're going to see a timeline of Western intellectual history. And this is just to kind of remind everyone that history is a timeline. This is year zero right here. So basically those are negative numbers and we are in the positive numbers. I'm going to start with prehistory, um, just to kind of let people know where we all came from. Uh, the Big Bang occurred about 14 billion years ago, give or take, and then it took about 6 to 8 billion years for the Earth to form. Um, and then over the next 6 billion years, we saw the Earth actually um, becoming a habitable place plants growing, waters emerging, and then the one-celled animals kind of coming from there. We're going to dive in about four million years ago with the hominids, and you'll see a picture over here on the right-hand side of what we think they looked like. Um, they emerged out of East and South Africa, um, specifically Ethiopia is where the first of the hominids came from about four million years ago. Now, these folks did not have very big brains, so we're not seeing a lot of advanced human activity for many, many, many years. So we're going to jump to about a million and a half years ago when Homo erectus emerged. Homo erectus is the upright human being. This is when we started walking on our legs. Prior to that, hominids walked pretty much like what if you imagined a gorilla or an orangutan they often use their arms as part of the walking process so homo erectus about a million and a half years ago they started walking upright and this involves a change to our skeleton that occurred evolutionarily very slowly over two million years after Homo erectus, we move into Homo sapien, otherwise known as the wise human being. And they emerged about 250,000 years ago. Uh, these folks um, emerged or uh, gave way to two other groups. The first group you'll see on the left are the Neanderthals. They are named Neanderthals because they were found in the Neanderthal region in Germany. Um, but their bones are also found throughout Europe and the Middle East. They were active 30,000 to 100,000 years ago. And the most important element about the Neanderthals were they buried their dead. They were the first civilization or group of people to bury their dead. 
Now, what does that mean? Essentially, what that means is they recognize there might be something that happens after a person dies. So they would bury them with tools and weapons for their next part of their journey. So Neanderthals are very important in terms of the development of understanding religion. Unfortunately, <coughs> they were extinct by 30,000 BCE. But at the same time that they were active, we had another group also active, and they were called the Homo sapiens sapiens. And the English version of that is the elder wise human beings. And they emerged out of Southwest Africa about 200,000 years ago. The important part to know about the Homo sapiens sapien is that anatomically, they are the same as we are today in terms of how big their brains were, um, the physiology, the way they walked, the way they um, digested food, their anatomy. So really, we look at Homo sapiens sapien as the first real humans as we exist today. 70,000 years ago, Homo sapiens sapiens started to spread outside of Africa. So, look over here where we circle Adam. Adam is, this is the um, area that was most uh, populated because we have the most bones in this area. You had the groups going in various directions. The first group went up to, to Europe, and then from Europe they went across the Russian area. Russia today is the largest land mass of any country. And over here, this is the Siberian region, which is about 3,000 mi 3, miles of ice, but there used to be an ice bridge or a um, ice uh, lake between Russia and Alaska, which is right here. So people were able to walk across. Now, they get into Alaska, they go through Canada, and then they ended up in North America. North America, you go down into Mexico and down into South America. Interestingly, at 10,000 BCE, after the last ice age, this ice bridge fell into the sea. And you did not see a lot of people going into this area after that, which is why the Native Americans were able to survive so long without really too much problems until Christopher Columbus showed up. But the folks who emigrated into North America and eventually made their way down to South America, you'll also notice that South Americans and Native Americans, or you know the American Indians, have very similar physiologies in terms of the shape of their nose, the color of their skin. You also had folks who were going across Asia, <coughs> and then down and across into Australia. So by 10,000 BCE, Homo sapiens sapien had dispersed around the globe. Um, interestingly enough, in the last few years with the um, advent of what we know about DNA, most of us carry some element of Neanderthal. So what they were able to do is extract the DNA from Neanderthal skeletons and compare it to modern human DNA. And what they were able to do is identify that, yes, in fact, most of us have some Neanderthal in us. Which means that back in the day when the Homo sapien sapien and the Neanderthal were on the earth at the same time, apparently they were getting a little busy with one another. We're going to move into the Paleolithic age now. This runs approximately 2.5 million BCE to 10,000 BCE. Um, the hominids, or humans, were hunter-gatherers, not farmers. These folks would move from location lo to location depending on the vegetation cycles. Remember, plants grow in the spring and the summer, and they're usually harvested at the end of the summer or the fall. So these folks essentially showed up, ate everything in sight, animal and vegetable, and then moved on to the next location. They weren't growing anything, they were just consuming. 
They lived in groups of 20 or 30 and um, essentially were as primitive as you can imagine. Another important aspect to keep in mind, and I have that listed over here, is that the systematic use of fire, in other words, being able to harness fire, occurred about a half a million years ago. So that was a major move towards a collective sense of community because now you could stay warm, you could cook your food, you could clean, you know, keep water hot. So there were a variety of reasons that people started kind of herding together in a sense. From the Paleolithic era, we move into the Neolithic, otherwise known as New Stone Age era. And this occurs about 10,000 to 4,000 BCE. An important date to remember was 10,000 BCE was the end of the last ice age. This was a revolutionary time because we developed systematic agriculture, which gave humans greater control over their environment. So rather than chasing food, they were able to stay in one location, plant seeds, harvest, and stockpile food. This was a major revolution in terms of how men and women had been living. This allowed them to create settled communities so they weren't constantly on the move anymore. And this became an especially important element around seven to 8,000 BCE in several areas. <clears throat> the most significant areas was Mesopotamia, and this is present day Iraq and southern Turkey. It was called the Fertile Crescent, and according to biblical scholars, the Garden of Eden was located at the intersection of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, right up here. And this is important because keep in mind that religion was developed as a way to explain things. So this is where civilization started. So of course their understanding of where the Garden of Eden would be is really where civilization essentially started. Another important place on this map is Ur. Ur is right here. And Ur is where Abraham, the father of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam was born. Um, Abraham, as far as historical figures, is the most important person to come out of this time period. Communities started to organize and stockpile food, and then if they had stuff left over, they were able to trade with other communities. And if you think about it from this perspective, you are growing wheat, and you have enough wheat to feed everyone in your village, and you have stuff left over. Now there's a village over 20, 30 miles down the way, and they are growing rye, which is a different kind of wheat. And they have all the rye they could use, and they have some left over, but they don't have any wheat. Here's a great opportunity to literally trade one kind of grain for another. This led to the development of writing, which ultimately was for the purpose of keeping track of trade. Men took responsibility for outside jobs and women for inside jobs. Over time, jobs performed outside the home came to hold a higher importance and men became the dominant role in society. Okay, so continuing with the Neolithic age, um, around 4000 BCE, craftspeople discovered that by heating rock with metal in it, it would melt the metal and it would be crafted into farming tools and weapons. And again, this is a major step towards the evolution of civilization because once you are able to develop tools, you're able to build things and harvest and do all the um, things that are associated with developing food sources. Um, after 4000 BCE, craftspeople in Western Asia discovered that if you melted copper and tin together, it made bronze, which was much stronger than copper. And bronze becomes a very important element in the next era of civilization, which would be called the Bronze Age. This ran from 3000 BCE to 1200 BCE. 
We call this the era of emerging civilizations. Um, it was the introduction of metal and metal implements into human society. And it also introduced writing. And we're going to talk about that in much more detail later. We have six emergent civilizations that all kind of evolved at the same time. And uh, the first one, Mesopotamia, which we're going to be looking at in more detail in this lecture. Egypt, which we'll be looking at next week. Um, and then there's India, China, Peru, and Central Asia, specifically Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. But uh, for the purposes of our class, we're going to be looking at Mesopotamia and Egypt. The characteristics of a civilization, and this is very, very important, um, these six elements really know these, back and forth. Number one, an urban focus. Cities became the center of development. All those little small communities grew together. And as these small communities grew together, they became larger and larger communities until eventually they became a city. Secondly, we have a distinct religious structure. Gods became essential to a community's success. Now, keep in mind that this is before anyone had any concept of science, chemistry, biology, physics, any of that. So they believed that gods were controlling those things that could not be easily explained. So for example, if their community is flooded out. It was because the gods were angry at them. On the other hand, if they had a terrific harvest, it was because the gods were rewarding them. So for them, it was a way of validating the vagaries of weather and science, things they didn't understand. Number three, a new political and military structure we are beginning to see the development of a government bureaucracy. And armies were created to first protect and then eventually to gain more land and more power. Because once you have a taste of power for a small little community, you want to run all of the communities. Number four, a new social structure based on economic power, specifically our hierarchy of classes. So you start to see the rich, you start to see the middle class, and you start to see the poor. Number five, the development of writing, which again, as I mentioned, was um, came about when trade was um, growing in importance. You had to keep track of what you were trading. And last but not least, new forms of significant artistic and intellectual activity. Because you have to think of it from this perspective. You are barely surviving. All day, every day, all you're doing is finding enough food for yourself and your family. Well, when you're in a civilization where food is stockpiled and you're no longer living every minute wondering where your next meal will come from, you now have time. And with that time came the opportunity to create pictures, create sculptures, create art, write stories. And this is a huge element of civilization. <clears throat> the first civilization we're going to be looking at, as I mentioned, is Mesopotamia. Uh, Mesopotamia, the word in Greek, means land between two rivers. And as I had mentioned, they, uh, it is the southern valley. Here's the Persian Gulf, and here's the southern valley where the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers intersected. And this is, again, supposedly the site of the Garden of Eden. Today, it's part of Iraq, it's part of Syria, Turkey, and Iran. But Iraq is the primary part of what we now know of uh, Mesopotamia. So let's talk about Mesopotamia, the early years. Small settlements in this area are dated back about 4,500 BCE. But we're not really talking a civilization at this point. We're talking about small communities. And they housed four major groups. We had the Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Babylonians, and the Assyrians. And you'll see the picture on the right-hand side is some archaeological art that was discovered 
It is dated using carbon dating back to about 2500 BCE. These are what the Sumerian warriors wore, and you'll see that they have a helmet on, they have a cape, they're carrying a spear, they are barefoot, and again, what you're looking at here is the first real understanding of what is important in terms of military protection, weaponry. Um, this was located at Ur. Now, Sumerian society, and that the Sumerians were the most advanced, so we're going to focus on them for right now. Sumeria is in southern Mesopotamia, and it was settled by the Assyrians from northern Mesopotamia about 4000 BCE. Scholars believe that the first city in the world was the Sumerian city of Eridu. And um, you'll see uh, the picture is supposedly what Eridu would have looked like. The city was settled by farmers, fishermen, and herders. And think about it. Farmers provided the agricultural support. Fishermen provided fish. And herders provided dairy, milk, as well as meat. Goat meat was very popular. Cows and sheep were very popular in this area. So this confluence of these settlers led to the development of what we call the first city on earth. Let's look at religion. As I had mentioned, religion is based on the idea that we can't explain something, so we're going to say that it is controlled by a supernatural force, being the gods or goddesses. And as a consequence to this, Mesopotamian religion and religion for many years up until Judaism really looked at polytheistic, multiple gods. You had gods for everything that was important to a society. Every city-state had a local temple. This local temple was called the ziggurat. So if you're looking at these pictures, the base is where a lot of the food stuff, the grains, would be stored. On top is where the priests would do their business. So you'll see that having the priests up here and the food source down there led to this being the center of town. And the priests became very, very powerful. Um, the priests would associate themselves with a certain god or goddess. So each city-state had its own god or goddess that the people prayed to and worshipped. And as a consequence to this, the people who ruled the city-state were oftentimes part of the religious structure. And this became known as a theocracy. So in the United States, we have a democracy, but where the countries are led by a religious leader, you see a theocracy. Um, Iran today is an example of a theocracy. The gods, and these are Sumerian gods, are based on sacred marriages. Now, let's talk briefly about the value of sacred couples. Keep in mind that up until the 20th century, the 1900s, the death rate for babies was ridiculously high because we didn't have any modern medicine. Now go back 4,000 years and you see why this concept of coupling of, you know, a man and a woman being together is so important because for a civilization to not only exist, but to continue to exist, you need children. And these children grow up to have more children. So in all the major religions, there is this pervasive sense that you should go forth, be fruitful, and multiply, populate the earth. So a lot of these early religions focused in on couples. So I'm going to just talk briefly about some of the major gods. Anu is the god of the sky. He's the most important force in the universe, and he judged people who committed crimes. Enlil is the god of air and wind, and you'll see down here the picture. He's got wings. The god's got wings. Um, Anki is the god of earth and rivers and inventions. And if that name sounds familiar, the Egyptians took a similar name for their major god, Anki with an A. Then we have Ninhursag. 
Nen Hersag is the mother goddess, and she is married to Anki, and she is a fertility icon. You can tell a fertility icon because the um, character or the representation, they usually have large breasts, demonstrate the genital area, whereas with the men, that te seems to be covered up. So when you see a protruding phallus on a man in a um, representation of sculpture, that generally implies that they're a fertility god. But the fertility goddess, generally you can tell by large protruding bosoms, much like today when you look at Playboy. So let's talk about the lifestyle of the Mesopotamians. Um, civilization evolved into three classes. We had the nobles, and these are the nobles up here, first row, royals and priests. Then you had the commoners. That's almost 90% of the population. They were the farmers, the merchants, the scribes. Scribes were the people who wrote stuff down. They are the ones who actually knew how to read and write. And these people were the second tier of society. Then you have the bottom tier of society. And these were the slaves. And you'll notice that even in the artwork, there's not a lot of fine detail placed on them. And they were owned by the palace and the temples and rich landowners. Now, a lot of what we have today is developed 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, even in the case of the potter's wheel. The potter's wheel developed before the wheel that went on the chariot or the wagon. And it was adapted to fit a wagon or a um, chariot. So the concept of the wheel was first developed around 3000 BCE to make pottery. You needed pottery because you needed to be able to cook, you needed to be able to put your food in things, you needed to be able to store things. So again, what you want to think about in terms of inventions throughout civilization, it is usually in response to something that's needed. They also developed sails for boats. You'll see pictures over here. And then probably my favorite invention is they developed beer and wine. And here you have a picture of the ancient Babylonians drinking beer through their straws. So they also invented the first form of writing, which is cuneiform. And um, you'll see here, there's just some general um, examples starting from 5000 BCE to 2500 BCE to um, later and later. And you'll see that the writing developed and it's the same thing with modern writing. You know, we, when I was a kid, we always had to learn cursive writing in school and now they're not teaching it anymore. Um, some people think it's an atrocity, but hey, you know, I never had to learn how to use a computer when I was in second grade. So you have to have go with the flow and go with where technology takes you. So the Sumerian temple priests needed to keep accurate accounts and again primarily involving trade and what was being kept and traded and they were the first to develop a system of writing um, and they used it for record keeping <coughs> and cuneiform skip script was invented. Um, cuneiform literally means wedge shaped and due to the triangular tip of the stylus or pen used for impressing signs on wet clay. And here's an actual example of something that was dug up with cuneiform on it. Um, men and women were both taught to read and write this type of script because it was for record keeping. It wasn't for dominating a group. It was for facilitating civilization. Now around this time we also see the first book of literature which is called the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, Gilgamesh was a Sumerian re ruler, and there are some elements that we believe Gilgamesh actually existed, but what we really believe is that the story itself is a compilation of things that Sumerian kings did, but they collected them all under this concept of Gilgamesh. So Gilgamesh is listed in Sumerian records as the king of Uruk and the builder of a great city wall. The story takes place over 12 books, and they are arranged upon the movement of the stars. Each division contains the story of a single adventure in the career of Gilgamesh. 
who searches for the secret to immortality, but ultimately never finds it. Keeping in mind that 4,000 years later, we still seek how to live longer. Um, and then last but not least, the whole story is a composite product. It is probably that some of the stories are artificially attached to the central figure. Like I said, these are, you know, mythos or regular stories that we have applied to Gilgamesh. It's like how what we learned about George Washington. You know, we learned all these stories about what a great guy he was, but not all of them were true. So it was really a way to demonstrate the fierceness and the bravery and the strength of Washington, but also in the same vein to represent the strength and fierceness and bravery of Gilgamesh. Now, one of the most important thing the Mesopotamians did was to develop the number and calendar system that we use today. So the Mesopotamian astronomers worked out a 12-month calendar based on the cycles of the moon. And the Sumerian calendar also measured weeks of seven days. So, you know, 4,000 years ago, just by looking at the stars and the moon, they were able to determine, you know, a calendar system that has been used for 4,000 years. The Mesopotamians also used a sex adjustment based 60 numeral system. Um, the source of our current 60 minute hours and 24 hour days as well as our 300 degree circle. And you'll see how they were able to develop this. If you look at your hand, and I know most of you now should be looking at your hands, you'll see that there are three segments per finger. Four fingers not including your thumb. So there you have your base 12. Then if you look at the hand that's on the left side, you'll see that if one is worth 12 and one is worth 24, 36, 48, add another 12, including the thumb, you have your base 60. So we look at our hand now and we realize this is literally where the idea of our clock came from, our idea of how many hours in the day, and it's really remarkable when you think about it that this was being done 4,000, 4,500 years ago. The next person we're going to talk about, his name is Hammurabi, Hammurabi, and he lived about 1792 to 1750 BCE, so he was 42 when he bit the bullet, when he went to the great um, Hammurabi in the sky. He was the king of the old Babylonians, and he took over Mesopotamia. He was a good leader, created a strong civilization that lasted for 200 years until the Kassites took over. In 1550. Now, there's a lot of good kings, but why is Hammurabi so important? And it's because he developed a code. And you'll see down here, and it's not easy to read, but you can see um, generally that the code of Hammurabi was in fact written in cuneiform. So he created a code of law, and this is a collection of 202 two laws. Um, his penalties were very severe. They varied according to the social class of the victim. So if you were an upper class noble, you were not punished as harshly as someone who was um, a lower class, like a farmer. An eye for an eye principle, the punishment should fit the crime. And again, to this day, especially in a religion like Islam, an eye for an eye is still very much the baseline for what is expected. But it also made city officials responsible for keep, keeping crime down, or else they would have to compensate the victims. So Hammurabi was not just thinking about keeping law and order, but he was also thinking about how to keep government officials responsible. He also provided consumer protection, which is really way far in the future for most civilizations. So, for example, if a building was faulty, the builder was held responsible. And a lot of the laws focused on marriage and family. And I'll be emailing you um, some examples of the Code of Hammurabi through email. But um, for an example, if anyone can, if anyone bring an accusation of any crime before the elders and does not prove what he has charged, he shall, if it be a capital offense charged, be put to death. So for example, let's say that I'm going to accuse one of you of murder, which is a capital crime. And I say that you murdered my um, 
your child. But if you can prove that I didn't mar uh, murder your child, then I get put to death. So this prevented false accusations. Interesting, a lot of the Code of Hammurabi, if you look at it from the context of modern day laws, they make sense to a lot of people because we have a lot of the same books on our same laws on the book today. So that's why Hammurabi is so important. So all good things have to come to an end, and um, Mesopotamia has to come to an end. So you get some land, you get some power, you get some money, or at least gold and riches, and now you're going to start fighting each other. So what you see from 3000 to about 2500 BCE and going on well into the next five, six, seven thousand years is wars. So you see Mesopotamia being characterized by a constant warfare and a constant succession of shifting empires. So the Babylonians would fall to the, to the Akkadians, the Akkadians would fall to the Sumerians, and this went on and on. Um, and by 2500 BCE, war became the standard. Mesopotamia limped along until the 6th century BCE, and that's when they eventually fell to the Persians. The Persians are going to show up again and again because they were the ones that the Greeks really had to fight in order to become the leading nation in the world. And if you saw the movie The three, um, 300, that's who the Greeks are fighting, are the Persians. 